Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, now let us confess our sin. We keep a moment of silent prayer here as we open up our hearts and our lives to the God of all grace and mercy. Let's pray together. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought and word and deed. By your grace forgive us, through your love renew us, and in your spirit lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also, and also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of a victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, 
the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength, and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the of victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing and honor and glory and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Thank you for being with us today. Hope you're having a great weekend, Fourth uh, of July, right? Fun celebration. Hope you've had a really good time. Um, I brought with me today one of my favorite toys, and I don't just mean from when I was a child, it's still one of my favorite toys, and it's my slinky, right? How many of you have a slinky at home? A lot? Right? A pretty simple, kind of fun toy. This is what I think that's amazing about slinkies, right? First they look like this, but then you can stretch them way out, and they still go back to the way they're supposed to be. Right? I mean, I think that's just kind of wonderful that they can bounce around, but in the end, they're always still a slinky in the way. They always come back to where they are supposed to be. I think that's a real good lesson for us as people, too. Right? I think sometimes we're a little bit like slinkies. We get a little stretched out. We're maybe really sad about something or mad about something. and. And, you know, maybe sometimes we just don't do what we're supposed to do. Or we fight with our brothers and sisters. We don't do what mom and dad tell us to do. And that's like the slinky being really stretched out. And it's kind of weaker. But God always brings us back to where we belong. He always puts us back together. That's what Jesus does for us. He helps us when we're kind of all stretched out and can't seem to get it right. And he helps us put it back together so that we can still be the way he made us to be. So when you're having a bad day and you're feeling kind of bad, maybe that's a good time to stop and, and say a prayer to Jesus and say, Jesus, pull me back together so that I can be just right and, and I can go on playing and having fun. Children's bulletins are on the website uh, for you for this morning, so enjoy those and have a great weekend. From the prophet Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious he is. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle shall be cut off, and he shall be commanded peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your downstrong, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read responsibly Psalm 145. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. 
Lord, you are all good. You are good to all, and your compassion is over all your works. All your works shall praise you, O God, and your faithful ones shall bless you. They shall tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power, that all people may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. You, Lord, are faithful in all your words and loving in all your works. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts those who are bowed down. The second reading is from the Epistle to the Romans. Paul writes, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now I do what I want, do not want. I agree that the law is good, but in fact it is no longer I that do it, but that sin dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer that I do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to Matthew, the 11th chapter, Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. For no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. Good and gracious Father, as we try to find our way through this moment in time, through every moment in our lives, whenever things seem uncertain and hard for us and we, we're just not sure we can do it, come now, walk beside us, take us by the hand, lead and guide us, help us, Father, uh, because we are so easily lost, that we may rest in you and find comfort and hope and know your grace every single day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to try an experiment here. For the next 30 seconds, do not touch your face. Right? I mean, that's one of the instructions they give us. Nurses tell us that all the time. Do not touch your face. That's one of the great ways you can protect yourself uh, from these viruses, not just this one, but from every kind of thing. It can get through your eyes and your nostrils and and so, you know, don't, don't touch your face. Now, I, I know that your nose is itching right now, but do not reach up and scratch it. Just, you know, yeah, I know it's itching and it's bothering you. And yes, your glasses are starting to slide down your face now. And, and, and I'll bet your hair is a little out of place, but don't, don't reach up and touch it, right? How are you doing? It's kind of hard, right? I have to stop now. I have to adjust my glasses. I have failed in the experiment. 
it's so hard to do something when somebody tells you not to do it. That may be like the hardest thing ever. But, but learning to understand that impulse, learning to live with that impulse, that may be the best thing ever. So I want to start today with uh, this uh, reading from the book of Genesis. I've been looking at these stories from Genesis, from the patriarchs, uh, all summer long. And here's this rather interesting story about Abraham that I should imagine strikes us all, at least in some way, as a bit odd. Partly, of course, because it, it's a story from a very different time. So Abraham has this problem. He has a son, finally, now. He has Isaac, who is reaching the marriage age and uh, helping Isaac find a wife, have a family, preserve the blessing, pass it on from generation to generations. That is all of Abraham's purpose in life now, as he's also getting pretty well on in years, too. The problem is, is that Abraham doesn't really want Isaac to take a wife from any of the neighboring Canaanite girls. He has concerns about them. They practice a different faith. He's not sure that, that any of them will help Isaac fulfill his mission of passing on the faith. He doesn't know what to do. Now, if he was back home, he would do what people always do. He would be surrounded by his own. They would uh, find a wife, make a match. That's one of the weird things, of course, about this text. It comes from an age when when uh, matches were chosen, partners were chosen for people, and women obviously had very little say in that as well. And, and so Abraham realizes that his only hope is to send someone back to where he came from, back to his own kin, and find, hopefully, in there, a woman uh, who will be an appropriate wife and partner for Isaac as things go forward. And so we get this chapter, the same story told actually three times. Abraham has sent his servant in. And the servant has this very particular idea of how he will identify the right woman for Isaac. The woman will come out, she will meet him at the well, she will offer him a drink, she will water his camels. And somehow that will be the telling point that he will know that this is the woman that God has chosen. Also kind of an unusual way to select a life partner, it seems to me. But anyway, that's what happens, right? The servant goes and he meets Rebecca. He negotiates with her family. Also another weird part of this story. And eventually, Rebecca agrees to leave with the servant and come and be Isaac's wife. What I find really key about this story is, is Abraham's dilemma. He is facing a situation he has never faced before. One that he is not prepared for. Having followed God's call to go and uproot his entire family and move to this strange land, Abraham finds himself alone and without the resources and the ability to solve a fairly pressing need, which is to find a wife for his son. And so he goes to these rather extraordinary lengths, and God shows him in this rather extraordinary sign, provides for him what he needs. But it's that moment for Abraham when Charlie he looks upon his son and he realizes that his son is of age to marry and he realizes that there are no immediate prospects to solve that problem and he has no way to help him, that helplessness that Abraham must have felt, I have a feeling we can all relate to that actually pretty well. Right? I mean, here we sit now in this moment dealing with problems that we are not really well equipped to handle. None of us in our lifetime have dealt with a worldwide pandemic. None of us have been ever asked before to simply go home and stay home for weeks and months on end. That is probably why we are doing such a really, really bad job of it. We just don't know how to. We don't know how to take care of ourselves. We don't know how to provide for ourselves. We don't know how to fight this disease. We don't even necessarily know much about this disease, this virus. And so here we are in this very helpless situation where all of our old ways of doing things, of you know, just getting up and going to the grocery store when you need groceries, or getting up and going out when you wanted to have a meal at a restaurant, all of those ways of doing things are taken away from us now. All of those ways are simply too dangerous. Everything we know won't work, could make it worse. And what do we do with that? How do we, how do we deal with that? This is a place where faith becomes so important. 
So I turn into the gospel, and I see Jesus looking at the people around him who are having a very similar sort of problem. He has come into this world and proclaimed himself the Son of God, the one, the Messiah. And they had some rather particular ideas, probably of what that meant and who he would be and what he would do. And then which Jesus seems to fall neatly into. And, and this comment that he makes is, is so perfect for its time. He says, I look at this generation and all they do is they whine and they complain. We played the flute and you would dance. We tried this and it didn't work. We mourned, but you wouldn't cry. We tried that and it didn't work either. Here are people seeing Jesus walk among, him, among them and, and are unable to make him work for themselves the way they want to. All of the things that they thought that they knew, all of their tried and true ways of dealing with problems don't work anymore all of their efforts to take control of the situation. They have been suffering for four centuries as well under all kinds of foreign occupation. Their lives are filled with all kinds of misery and it's very hard for them. But over and over again, they find the things that they do don't seem to work. They look at John the Baptist and they see this man who does not eat or drink, who lives this really crazy, aesthetic kind of lifestyle. And they assume, well, he must be possessed by demons because that's not normal. They look at Jesus who claims to be the Messiah who walks around like a normal person and eats and drinks and spends time with tax collectors and sinners for heaven's sakes. Well, he can't be the Messiah. None of these things fit into their preconceived notion of how things can be, how things should be, how things must be. Everything they're doing is not working. Does that sound familiar yet? I mean, that's it, isn't it, right? What does it mean in all of the moments of our life when the things that we think should work don't, when the things that we do do not turn out the way we want them to do, when we have this overriding sense of no longer having control, over ourselves, over our lives, over our world, over our friends, over our families, over anything. The sense of being in this very helpless place to which there does not seem to be much of an end. What shall we do? Jesus shifts from this conversation into something pretty unexpected, but I think really important. He starts talking about burdens. Now on one hand, I think, well, that's, that makes sense. I'm carrying this terrible burden with me. All of this pain and suffering, all of my own struggles to make sense of my life, all of these desires to do things. Jesus doesn't say, well, let me make those burdens go away for you. Jesus does not say, no problem, I'll make it all better. He does not say, I'll make it work out the way you want it to. He does not say, here, let me give you control of things so that you can take charge of your life and be happy again. No, he says, my burdens are easy to bear. What burdens is he talking about? I think it's exactly that burden. To, to take on a Savior, to proclaim Him Lord, is to confess that we are not in charge, that we are not in control, that we no longer will make the choice, that we will follow where He has chosen for us to go. To follow Jesus is simply to follow. And that's hard for people who want to lead. And that's our burden. That is the burden of faith. To simply bear with the life we have, the challenges we face, the enormities of our calling, our terrific responsibilities to ourselves, and to one another, and to simply bear that burden, to carry it with us, to go where we must go, and to do what we must do, and to somehow stop complaining because it's not being done the way we want it to be done, but to simply accept that God has set our path, that Jesus has shown us our way, and that as hard as it is, as painful as it is, 
It's what we got to do. One of the complaining that I know that I hear a lot these days, one of the things I know that's a hard burden for all of us, is that we cannot be here in this room for church on Sunday morning. For too long, that has been the way we have defined our, our spiritual experience. The 60 minutes we spend together in this room, worshiping in the way we have always worshiped, doing things the way we like to do them, and, and then, you know, another 30 or 45 minutes for coffee and fellowship afterwards. And that's been taken away from us. Because now we are in a situation that we cannot control. And we are being forced to carry this burden that we must find God, that we must find a way to worship, that we must find a way to pray without the tools, the resources, the experiences, the traditions that have always been a part of that for us. And we, like that first generation, are lost in our complaining. This is not working, God. This, is, this doesn't work for me. I need to be able to sit in that pew on Sunday morning. I need to be able to do it the way I understand. This technology is impossible and I cannot figure it out. But Jesus says, my burden is easy to bear. My yoke is light. I know it seems hard, but I know you can do it. I know, Jesus says, that you can carry on like this or in whatever way will be our future. Jesus says you can still be a follower of Jesus, even if it means you have to learn a new way to do it. We also had this little reading from Paul, from Romans 7, this amazing part of the Bible, where Paul tells us the truth about ourselves and about faith. Paul confesses the reality that we all know is true. I do not do the things I know I'm supposed to do. I do not even do the good things I actually want to do. What I usually do are the things that I know I'm not supposed to do. In fact, what I usually do are the bad things that I wish I could stop. This is the truth of me. While I act as if I am in control, while I say I believe strongly in my own free will, while I am willing to take on the responsibilities for who I am, all of that is false and hollow because I never actually do it, never actually solve the problem. All of the tools that I think that I have, all of the good that I think that is in me fails me every single day. And I keep coming to moments like this one where all of the things I think that I know and all of the good I think I can do is, is useless, it's worthless, it's helpless. It's not solving the problem. And Paul turns from that moment to the most amazing place. He finishes this long confession with these great words. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Having finally owned up to the fact that he is not in control, that he's not in charge, that things will not go the way he wants them to go, Paul discovers that God already knew that was there way before he got there. And that God loves us, not just in spite of our inability to do the right thing, but because of it. That God does not expect us to be in perfect control to solve all of the world's problems, to figure it out by ourselves. God expects us simply to accept the gift of His grace and bear its burden in our life every day. Sometimes, the hardest gifts to keep are the ones that you don't think you deserve. Maybe that's why we cling so hard to this notion of free will. We want to earn our way. We want to feel proud about the things we have accomplished. Grace is neither of those. Grace instead is this gift that God gives us that we do not deserve. Grace is this promise of our baptism put upon us before we were even old enough to think for ourselves. Grace is God's will and not mine. God's way and not mine. And while on the one hand it imposes upon us this burden of following Jesus, of fulfilling the promises of the kingdom, of living together in justice and in peace, 
Yet it promises us that that is not as big of a hardship as we pretend that it is. We can, in fact, be good. Oh, not by ourselves, but because God can help us, show us, lead us, push us if necessary, make us good. When we stop expecting things to work out the way we're trying to make them work out, when we stop expecting the world to be the way that we think it should be, when we can start accepting the fact that we are not in charge, then we can be saved. Then we can be saved. There is more to us and more to our faith than what takes place in 60 minutes on Sunday morning in the building that we call the church. We are better than this. We are stronger than this. And though all of this may be a huge, enormous burden on us, this calling of the world to finally change things, we can do this. This is the burden that Jesus has given us. But do not be afraid. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Put your life, put yourself in his hands, and he will bring us home to his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. With the whole church now, let us confirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus now, let us pray for the church, for all of our neighbors in need, and for all of God's creation. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we do not know how to solve the problems that lie in our path. We do not know where we are going or how we will get there. We're hopeless and helpless in this brand new place. Now grant us faith, O oh Lord, to listen and watch for your guidance, to find our way forward, to be at peace and have patience as we wait for your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, save us from our need to control, for our need to make things about ourselves, for our need to be in charge. Fill us with your spirit of faith, O Lord, and free us that we might know your grace even in the midst of our brokenness and our pain. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so, O Lord, today we lift up to you a world in need. We pray, O Lord, that you would come and save us from all that would harm us. Protect us from sickness. Save us from hate and violence. Help us, O oh Lord, that we might serve you and serve your world in all of its need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, we pray for all of our friends and neighbors who need your help this day. And we remember those who are sick, and those who are hospitalized, and those who are recovering from surgery, and those who are fighting against disease. And we pray, O oh Lord, for all who grieve this day, that you might lift up their sorrow, that you might move them toward the day of resurrection. We ask now, O oh Lord, that you would look upon all who we name here before you now, out loud and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these prayers, O oh Lord, we give to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you with mercy and grace. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Well, good morning again. Good morning again. Thank you for being with us for worship this morning. Hope you're having a, a great weekend. Did you've had a great uh, celebration for the fourth, and hope that you're well. And always want to remind you if you have any needs of any kind, uh, want to please reach out and uh, let me help. I have lots of people who are looking for ways to serve their neighbors, and if you have needs, we'd be glad to help you out as well. Uh, we continue on the path that we were on, that we've been on now for over three months. Uh, we have a targeted date of the first Sunday in August to return to a limited in-person worship. Uh, we will keep you informed as we go forward as to whether that's going to actually happen or not. But in the meantime, let me just challenge you to find new ways to uh, fill your spirit, to uh, lift up your heart. We have uh, Compline Prayers every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. It's a Zoom meeting, and that link it will come to you both in an email and on our Facebook page as well. Um, I try to be on Facebook every morning at 8 o'clock with just a few words to start the day and a little bit of prayer as well. And we're always open. I'm always open to finding new ways to help you, uh, especially in this time when our faith is so terribly important to us, uh, to not just simply let go because we cannot be in our building together. So um, take good care of yourselves. Uh, reach out as we can help you all. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.